we'd like to, um, first of all, welcome everybody. We are so glad to see so many of you here in support of uh, Roy and, and all of the um, women priests and our, the future of our church. Um, I guess Roy Bourgeois, Father Roy Bourgeois, really does not need a lot of introduction to those of you who are here tonight. You know his history with the Marinol um, religious order and his work in South and Central America. You know of his uh, many, 22, I believe it is, years of leading the uh, School of the Americas Watch and his other efforts toward peace for which he has been recognized with uh, other awards and uh, we're just very grateful that we could participate in this national tour that is sponsored by Women's Ordination Conference and Call to Action National. When I left the university with a degree in geology, it was easy for me to become um, an officer in the military. I thought of making the military a career. And in my fourth year, I volunteered for shore duty in Vietnam. Believing our leaders, they said our cause was noble. We were going to be the liberators. Well, Vietnam became that turning point for many of us as the war in Iraq and Afghanistan is becoming the turning point for others. I've come to the conclusion that we are not made for war. Our loving God, our creator, did not make us to go about the business of killing. We have this conscience, we have a heart. And that experience in Vietnam, the violence, the suffering, losing friends there, wounded there, simply forced me into the arms of God. It was in Vietnam, really as my year was coming to an end, realizing I could no longer stay in the military, I felt that God was calling me to serve my church as a priest. I talked to this army chaplain, didn't know where to go with that. He recommended the Marino community, and I said, Mary who? I had never heard of this woman. <laughs> Working in 25 countries around the world, serving the poor. And I, because I was mayor, was able to pursue my vocation as a priest in the Catholic Church. I wanted to be a healer, a peacemaker after that experience in Vietnam. I came home, and I was just so happy to be reunited with family and friends. And then those years in the seminary was a new chapter. It was like a new beginning. When I was ordained a Catholic priest, I was assigned to our mission work in Bolivia. And this slum on the outskirts of La Paz became my home for the next five years. And it was here where the poor became my teachers. It was here where they really introduced to me Miss Gringo from Louisiana, you know, they're, they're struggling. Um, most of the people there is throughout the developing world living on the edge, struggling for survival. In the shacks without running water, without schools for their children, not having medicines to get when they're, they're sick. And it, it sad me to see my country in Bolivia supporting a brutal dictator, General Hugo Banzer, who came into power through a violent coup. What happened in Bolivia happens throughout countries where brothers and sisters are oppressed. Uh, they begin to organize and speak out and say, basta, enough. They want peace, they want justice, they want a living wage, they want to live in a house, you know, with running water. They want food for their children. And they want to be able to go to bed at night without fear in their lives. <laughs> that military dictatorship, I must say, was brutal. It was in Bolivia that I was introduced to a new theology, a theology of liberation, that really empowered the poor, that gave them hope. <clears throat> it was a very circular model of church, where all were welcomed into that circle, and getting away from that top-down model that, that I was so accustomed to. It was a church that really gave hope to people, it was in my fifth year that I was arrested, among the many they are arrested. I was one, one of the lucky ones, actually. So many were killed, and I was forced out of the country. I had to come back home. 
And it was a difficult time, lonely time. For many of us, our attention turned to now to El Salvador. Archbishop Oscar Romero had just been assassinated. Four church women who went there to work with the, the poor from our country. Two of their married old sisters were, were good friends. Uh, these four church women were killed by the military there. And uh, it saddened us, it brought many of us there. And when we went to El Salvador, once again, we, fought, we saw our country deeply involved, giving guns and training to those who <coughs> it. it was the slaughter of the innocents in El Salvador. We came back and protested against that military aid. But we couldn't stop the violence, the bloodshed. It continued. The military aid went up to a million dollars a day, all from our tax money. And then they went after the Jesuits because they were speaking out on behalf of the poor, as was Bishop Romero and the church one and so many others. November the 16th, 1989, six Jesuits, along with their co-worker, young mother Elber and her teenage daughter, were massacred. And when a congressional task force went to investigate, they reported that those responsible were trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. And that's when I and a small group who had been very involved in Latin American issues and now El Salvador, we went there to Fort Benning to start doing some homework and research. And what we found really was this school of assassins, as it was known in Latin America a school that had trained over 60,000 soldiers from 18 countries, many of them dictators. And when we learned that those responsible, when the United Nations reported that those who killed Bishop Romero were graduates of this school, those who raped and killed the church were the graduates, and those who killed the Jesuits and the two women also graduates, and the list went on and on, word spread. And we said, let us gather each November at the main gate of Fort Benning to keep the memories alive of the many victims and call for the closing of the school. And each year our numbers would grow. We started really there with 10 some 20 years ago. And this last November, some 15,000 gathered from all over the country. Quite a few always come in from Portland. And, um, when we look out at the sea of people there, I would say half would be the, the students, college students and high school students. A lot of military vets, lots of women religious, the nuns who joined our group in the very beginning. The very first group to pass a resolution calling for the closing of that school was the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, 75,000 members. A lot of the parents come with their children and it's a weekend, really, it's a celebration of hope. What we're asking for is not complicated. <clears throat> we want that school shut down. It has caused untold suffering and death in so many coups in Latin American countries. And it's all financed with our tax money. Millions of dollars that we say we want that money going into schools for our children and not this kind of school. And in May, we're going to have a vote on a bill, H.R. 2567, calling for the cutting off of that funding. And next week, actually, we're going to, two weeks, actually, we're going to be in Washington, D.C., to lobby. We're asking that you write letters to your members of Congress, calling for them to cut off that funding and use that money right here in Portland, where it's needed, or in Haiti, in Chile, and other countries. I asked them to check out our website for more information about this issue so I could move on here. Um, SOAW.org. Now this is what I call medicine. <laughs>
Thank you.